Mr. President, thank you so much for having me. I'd like to know what are your hopes for this initiative and more broadly, what are your hopes for the, the Middle East? Well, it's obvious to me that the uh, Palestinians and the Israelis and the Jordanians and the Lebanese and the Syrians and the Egyptians all basically want peace. That's the people themselves. The obstacle has always been in the Middle East, the uh, leaders. I know that um, the agreement that we worked out between Israel and Egypt uh, more than 25 years ago has never been violated on either side. And I was hoping that it would provide a foundation for a future agreement in its totality. I think the Geneva uh, Accords represent the best, uh, I would say, blueprint for future peace for the Mideast, and I think the only one. Obviously, it will have to be modified as circumstances change and as direct negotiations take place and as various leaders exert into the process their own opinions. But uh, I think that the basic premises of the Geneva Accords is, is the only foundation that I see in its totality to cover all the aspects of what is necessary for bringing peace to uh, Israel, recognition by Israel's neighbors, and justice and hope for the Palestinians. One of the main critiques on the Arab side was to say that it doesn't really recognize the right of return for refugees. It was seen as being unfair for that reason. What's your take on this? Well, the right of return has been a premise that's been endorsed by United Nations resolutions from the very beginning of the, uh, or the foundation of a, of a nation of Israel. And I think it's a, it's a consideration or a premise that has to be honored. Exactly how it's consummated, though, is something that the Geneva Accords tried to uh, address. And I think relatively in a balanced way. There will have to be some limit in the future on how many Palestinians actually return into the interior of a nation of Israel. And it doesn't preclude that uh, uh, acknowledgement of the rights, but it does give the Israeli government uh, the future responsibility of deciding how many and when they should come in and, and obviously where they live. I think the, the main other two premises for the right of return being honored as a principle is the compensation of those who've lost their property in, a, in a, an honest and, and fair way and the right of return to a Palestinian state, uh, which I hope will be established in the future. If the international community and the U.S. government don't intervene to stop the building of settlements and to stop the building of defense, what will be the window for such a court to be implemented? Well, there won't be any window that's open wide enough for hope if the settlements uh, continue uh, and if the, the so-called fence or, or barrier wall is extended and intrudes uh, in an unwarranted fashion on the lives and property of the Palestinians. So if these two premises uh, exist, there is no hope for peace. The premises that have guided uh, all negotiators in the past until recent years and have uh, continued to guide all American presidents since the United States has played a preeminent role as a mediator or negotiator has been that settlements in the West Bank were illegal and were an obstacle to peace and that they should be withdrawn from the West Bank, which is Palestinian territory. The uh, Geneva Accords recognized the necessity for some deviation from this uh, bare principle, and that is that certain portions of the West Bank would continue to be used by established uh, Israeli settlements. I think more than half the uh, Israeli settlers would be authorized under the Geneva Accords to retain their place uh, geographically. And as a token uh, response, a, a small portion of Israeli territory would be ceded to the Palestinians, which makes it appear to be fair. And if that's done, then I think it'll be fine. As far as the wall is concerned, being built with major plans for intrusion in deeply into the uh, West Bank and the territory uh, enjoyed by Palestinians, that's something that, that will probably have to be addressed uh, twofold. One is through decisions of the uh, Israeli Supreme Court. And I think the recent decision uh, on one aspect of the wall has been encouraging. Uh, in my opinion, the wall can be there, it won't hurt anything, provided it adheres fairly closely uh, to the Green Line. 
Uh, they might ultimately be places where the wall would uh, be on the Israeli side of the Green Line. There might be other places where it's uh, on the Palestinian side of the Green Line, but in general adhere to that. And uh, I think that the major b settlements that have been built immediately contiguous uh, to, uh, to the Israel and contiguous to the major settlements in Israel, that is in Jerusalem, uh, I think that was a fair approach, although not a final one. So what do you think would be the impact of this ruling, uh, controversial ruling uh, two weeks ago of the International uh, Court? Will that have any impact or? Well, the international community will have to decide, first of all, in a legal term, the relationship between the International Criminal Court and the uh, United Nations Security Council itself. And this uh, decision will not be an easy or proper one, but with the influence of the United States uh, exerted almost exclusively for Israel, I believe that the practical result will be that Israel will not adhere to the ruling of the International Criminal Court and will, uh, and will ignore the ruling. But it's a matter of, of record now on the global scene, and I think it will be a deterrent, or a small deterrent at least, uh, to the further encroachment into the West Bank of any future building of the wall. Most European governments think that the U.S. government over the last 60 years have been, um, has been one-sided in supporting Israel. Do you share that opinion? And if not, why do you think there is such a perception <laughs> in Europe? Well, I have to say that I'm a little bit biased in my response because I don't think that uh, most Israelis or most Egyptians or most Palestinians or most knowledgeable uh, Europeans would think that under my administration we were overly biased toward one side or the other. I think we had a, a, a very uh, fair approach. And all the agreements that I helped to consummate uh, at Camp David between the Israeli leader uh, and the Egyptian leader were affirmed later on by the entire parliaments, uh, governments of Israel and Egypt. If they had been un unfair what I negotiated, they, they wouldn't have been approved. Uh, and I would say that up until this present administration in Washington, there has been a genuine effort by all presidents, um, Republican and Democrat, to play a, a, a fair role as honest brokers in this very difficult uh, circumstance, never uh, relinquishing our commitment to the preservation of the, of the peace and existence of Israel, but to provide at the same time justice and fairness uh, and hope for the Palestinians. Uh, this was uh, exhibited by George Bush Sr. when he was president when he even threatened at one time to withhold all American aid from uh, Israel if they built settlements illegally, in my opinion, between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, I recall. And uh, President, President Bill Clinton, during the last uh, months of his term, I think gave his best effort uh, to creating a proposal that might be acceptable in the future to resolve the basic differences. So except for the incumbent president, George uh, W. Bush, all previous presidents had tried at least in their own ways to be uh, trusted by both sides and to work with both sides to reach a common agreement acceptable to the negotiators themselves. I'd like to talk about Camp David II in, 2000, in July 2000 when Ehud Barak and uh, Yasser Arafat met under, the, under Bin Clinton. Most commentators have said that basically Arafat ran away from a huge chance for peace. Do you agree with that position? There are two answers to that question. One is that Arafat ran away from a much better proposal than he would, was ever able to get uh, from Barak's successors. And so that was a good proposal compared to what is now the prospect for the Palestinians at the present time. I've seen the detailed maps of what was proposed and I don't think that there was any way for Arafat to accept that uh, as a final agreement. Uh, it still uh, committed the Palestinians to two 
are very difficult premises. One is that there were wide uh, array of uh, Israeli settlements guaranteed to be maintained geographically almost all over the West Bank. The, the places in between uh, the settlements and the roads combining them were offered to the Palestinians. And the premise also that was very difficult for Palestinians was that uh, East Jerusalem was inherently part of Israel, but the Palestinians would have uh, very generous rights to intrude on Israeli territory in East Jerusalem. Those two premises were, were very difficult, if not impossible, for Palestinians to accept. So another claim by the Palestinian leaders was that uh, this was not uh, a proposal that was negotiated by the two leaders uh, in advance. It, it was a unilateral proposal that was uh, developed in Israel, in effect approved by the Americans and presented as a take it or leave it proposition uh, before Arafat, and I think he decided uh, to leave it. In my opinion, uh, he made a mistake by peremptorily rejecting the entire proposal. I think he should have accepted it as a good step forward, at least, and should have said, let's continue to negotiate uh, to improve some of the problems in it that I uh, still see for the Palestinian people. He didn't do that. And he left the impression, which I don't think is inaccurate, uh, that he uh, could have done more to build upon that, that uh, generous proposal from the side point of view of the Israelis. Subsequently, though, that proposal was taken as it existed, and uh, further negotiations were carried out based on that proposal, and ultimately were encapsulated in the Geneva Accords. And uh, that, I think, is a basic uh, premise, that the Geneva Accords have a good foundation in, in historical events. The Geneva Accords were a great improvement over what uh, Barack and uh, Clinton proposed to Arafat. And I think the Geneva Accords, to repeat myself, uh, uh, and the premises therein, do provide the, the only overall proposal on, on which our future negotiations can hope to be successful. If the basic prim principles of the Geneva Accords are rejected, I don't see any hope for peace uh, any time in the future in, uh, in Israel. I think also there has been a, uh, uh, what may be a firm declaration on the part of uh, some Arab leaders, uh, many of them, very influential ones, including uh, Crown Prince Abdullah in Saudi Arabia, that if Israel would agree with the basic principles of the uh, Geneva Accords, um, that full recognition of Israel, its right to exist, its right to exist in peace and harmony with its neighbors might be forthcoming. That's, a, that's another factor that is still uh, uncertain, but it does offer a promise that future good faith negotiations can be successful. There is this belief outside the U.S. mostly that there is a strong connection between the lack of prospect for peace for Palestinians, the one-sided U.S. policy in favor of Israel, and the rise of Islamic terrorism. What's your take on it? Well, I have uh, privately and publicly uh, condemned the uh, ill-advised policies of the Bush administration concerning any hope for peace uh, in the Middle East. Uh, the so-called roadmap principles are very good but we have not pursued them with any degree of uh, persistence or tenacity or aggressiveness. And um, in the last two and a half years, uh, there, have, there have been no real contacts between the Bush administration and the Palestinian community to try to find some basis for negotiation. And I don't think there's any doubt that, that the uh, rise of of uh, violence uh, in the Holy Land itself uh, has been uh, attributable to the lack of hope, the lack of progress, the lack of good faith negotiations uh, in the Mideast peace process. At the same time, I think the, the, the general feeling uh, throughout the Arab world is that the Palestinian 
rights have been neglected at, at uh, best and ignored at worst, violated perhaps even. And this has aroused a, a, an unprecedented level of uh, animosity and distrust. Even among countries that have formerly been among our closest allies, namely uh, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, uh, the people of those countries overwhelmingly now look with distrust and condemnation on the United States, primarily because of the question that you asked whether or not Palestinian rights were being honored uh, in Washington. So I think that in the future, uh, there needs to be a, a more um, sensitive uh, attention given to, to the full incorporation of the fellow Palestinian point of view in negotiations. Uh, and I think that they should be and will have to be patterned after the principles that have been incorporated in the Geneva Accords. Do you think there's enough public discussion among politicians here in the U.S. about the Middle East peace process? No, it's not easy to discuss Middle East peace process in the United States. There are a few voices that have uh, spoken out, I think, in what I consider to be an objective way about the Middle East peace process. But, but politically speaking, in the U.S. Congress and, and among candidates for the White House, uh, the political consequences of, uh, of addressing Palestinian issues publicly and uh, forthrightly and fairly uh, are very severe. And uh, I think the strong influence of Israeli supporters in the United States has tended to preclude any open uh, and, and balanced discussion of the issues in, in our country. On the other hand, do you think that Europe has been also in that process not very balanced and very much anti-Israel and not mentioning the fault of some Arab states? Well, one reason that the United States assumed the leadership in the uh, altercations involving Israel was, was because of the default of Europeans to, to assume their, their international responsibilities, and, and we kind of fell into that uh, responsibility. As you know, uh, I don't, I'm not really familiar with the details of public statements uh, in countries like Germany and France and Italy and, and other European uh, capitals, whether they are grossly balanced toward the Palestinians to the detriment of, of Israel's uh, right for peace and, and full recognition, I don't know. But um, what has to be done, regardless of all those uh, theories and, and, and outside opinions, is that whoever is responsible for negotiating and whoever might hope to claim the trust of, say, the Palestinians and the Israelis at the same time, which is likely the United States, has to have uh, a common commitment to the rights of both sides. And a, and, a, and a clear and, and understandable, uh, a publicly uh, comprehensible status as being uh, honest and trying to, to realize the, the rights and honor the stature and the privileges and the hopes and dreams of both sides. That has to be done. Do you see the United States with the international community going from a job of, of peace broker to being a peace enforcer? Well, the ultimate decision about the future of Israel and the future of the uh, West Bank and Gaza really resides uh, in Israel. And I think that this is where the debates are taking place. They don't take place in the United States. They take place in Jerusalem, and they take place among Israelis. What is the future of Israel? What is the future of the Israeli people? What is the future of a Jewish state? What is the fair uh, approach to the Palestinian uh, concerns and problems and rights that will most likely uh, end the threat of terrorism or violence against our Israeli people and ensure peace and stability in the region? The Palestinians don't have the power to make those final decisions. 
uh, the concerted military and political uh, authority of the entire Arab world doesn't have that ability. It's only Israel that can decide its own future. And so the basic decision to be made by Israel, which is quite clear to me and to many Israelis too, is do we want to have um, Israel intact within its original boundaries as modified to accommodate some settlements in the West Bank in peace with uh, an adjacent Palestinian state recognized by every Arab nation as having a right to existed, existing peace and uh, diplomatic status on an equal basis with the rest of the world. In other words, does Israel want permanent peace with recognition, uh, relationships that are positive with its neighbors, with the rights and dreams of the Palestinians recognized or not? And in my opinion, a key question here that hasn't yet been resolved is what about the Israeli settlements? If the Israelis say we, we, we uh, reject all of that hopeful permanent peace and recognition with our neighbors because we insist on the right to build uh, settlements and, and uh, colonize the Palestinian territories, then that's a decision that I think would be uh, mistaken, but it's one that the Israelis themselves uh, will have to make. What are the main factors that prevent peace in the region? Well, again, I think the basic problem uh, is twofold. On the Palestinian uh, Arab side, it's their refusal uh, clearly to acknowledge now or to promise in the future that Israel will have a right, unquestioned right, to live in peace uh, as a respected neighbor. A and that commitment, if made, could greatly alleviate concerns in Israel and lead toward better prospect for peace. On the Israeli side, I would say it's the determination of some Israelis, I think a minority of Israelis, who have a fervent religious beliefs that Israel includes the West Bank and Gaza, and that the Palestinians have no sovereign rights over to the, that area of land. And, and that uh, question in Israel and the refusal of the Arab world, including Palestinians, to recognize Israel, those are the two factors that haven't yet been realized. There's another very important thing to remember. Uh, everyone talks about violence, but if you look back at the history of the region, whenever there was a, 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 a patent and clear commitment to peace, there's been no violence when I was negotiating at Camp David, and for several years after that, there was no violence. There were no th threats of terrorist acts on the one hand, or the destruction of uh, Palestinian homes uh, on the other hand. Later, when the Norwegians negotiated under the uh, leadership of Rabin and Perez and Arafat, the so-called Oslo Accords, there was a, a period of complete harmony and a co total absence of violence and fear. And even later, in January of 1996, uh, when the Carter Center was invited to go over and monitor the first election for the Palestinians, where they chose their leaders for parliament and for president, uh, there was no violence at all. There was no threat of intimidation, no fear of violence. Or, or terrorism. I was there. My daughter was there. My grandson was there, uh, monitoring an honest and fair and safe election. And, and there was hope that this was a new era. So the point is that in the future, in my opinion, with, if the same circumstances can be recreated once again, as at Camp David, David, as in the Oslo Agreement, as during the election process for the Palestinians, then peace will prevail. And um, that's a time and a circumstance about which I dream um, and for which I pray.